It's kind of, it's kind of funny that this weirdo found our our yeah. our YouTube shit and put this so big this? paragraph. I I checked him out and I've actually almost started to feel bad. Like he seems like a really crazy old man. <laughs> like probably lonely, I'm guessing. Just guessing from like just the way he looks at his picture and he's and his like obsession with his like homemade uh religion i guess <laughs> and his youtube page is really fucking lame he has like one video that's um how to make biscuits it's pretty i mean i forget even what it was i gotta check it out now oh yeah this is what made me feel bad his one video is one minute and three seconds long and it's just entitled first video after stroke and you just see a picture of him like in in a hospital bed. I haven't watched the video. I don't really want to. <laughs> but then his name on YouTube is A God for the Atheist. So, for the listener, <laughs> we we do have a YouTube channel with all the, the podcast episodes up. Um, that's it. We haven't made any real videos, but... Um, you know, just because I feel like that's something you're supposed to have, I guess. It seems like a necessity for podcasts, whatever. I don't know. And uh, People like YouTube. We rarely... People like to entertain their eyes. I don't fucking know why. <laughs> yeah. Imagine I... having time to watch videos. Anyway, this weird guy commented on our, like... Our bullshit jobs part two episode, which he obviously didn't listen to at all, um, and so it was just it was funny to see this like long block of text uh, as a comment because we yeah like I said we barely have any people subscribed we're just putting up our episodes nothing nothing else but anyway this weird guy who's whose handle on YouTube is a god for the atheist, said to us, Right from the start, you are wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I was just thinking, like, what is he talking about? Um, does, he, does he disagree with David Graeber's thesis <laughs> about bullshit jobs? No, it turns out it seemed I I finally figured out. I think he's just responding to the Cormac McCarthy quote that is uh, in our intro theme music. Um, it's kind of a, a dark poetic description of the universe, something like that. Um, and this guy just this guy had to like set us straight philosophically and <laughs> theologically. Um, he he continues after telling us we're wrong right from the start. Uh, we do not go in the same circle, because while energy cannot be created or destroyed, it is constantly changing form. Ever since that singularity realized it existed, I think, therefore I am. And everything else is just a product of my consciousness. All I know is I am, he does a lot of all caps for emphasis, all I know is I am and cannot know the answer to that big bang explosion of questions of dot dot what, when, where, how, or why. I know I exist. Exist but the evidence, logic, and reason tells me I think therefore I am dot dot as a singularity of I and the realization of I am, the I am used the binary system to create our universe. As one good consequence, repeat zero bad consequence. Do not repeat through that. All right, this is just, this is total gibberish. I am not going to read any more of it. But he, uh, yeah. Yeah, he just goes on in that way. Uh, I realized reading it out loud is really um, maddening. I probably wouldn't want to hear me read that. Uh, so, yeah, there's we got about halfway through his his block of text there. Um, yeah, so that's what we've been up to.
He walked out in the gray light and stood and he saw for a brief moment the absolute truth of the world. The cold relentless circling of the intestate earth. Darkness implacable. The blind dogs of the sun in their running. The crushing black vacuum of the universe. And somewhere 200 animals trembling like ground foxes in their cover. Borrowed time and borrowed world and borrowed eyes with which to sorrow it. And lo, for the earth was empty of form, and void, and darkness was all over the face of the deep, and we said, look at that fucker dance. Okay, welcome to Heat Death of the Universe, your reason, logic, and Big Bang Singularity podcast, a god for the atheist. You know what I mean? <laughs> today is... Mostly. Today is September 9th. It is 2021. It's also a Thursday, Thursday evening, 8.19 p.m. Korea Standard Time. And uh, we've got a real cornucopia of stuff to talk about. I guess mostly current events, uh, <laughs> mostly filtered through uh, Twitter. <laughs> um and just the internet generally. I guess that's how everyone gets their information for the most part. I like to think of Twitter as the great bullying plates of the internet. <laughs> like the, the the whale's mouth of the internet, you mean? Exactly. That's where, where it and fi- Twitter. It fi- filters, it filters out. What it lets everything the, it, that's let, not krill lets the krill and plankton through. <laughs> mm. So we're gonna read you some krill and plankton from uh, the Twitter verse, I guess. Yeah, just imagine Twitter as a giant flying blue whale bird. Ah, uh, that makes it actually a lot nicer to think about as an abstraction. Sometimes it's just like this hideous um, display of human consciousness <laughs> well imagine if your job was to filter all of human consciousness into a timeline yeah i mean as long as it didn't have to like uh be conscious of all of that stuff myself if i could just be a sort of zen minded blue whale then i'm all for it mm. so um I was sad to hear that Michael K. Williams died. Uh, just up top here, we'll talk about this, I guess. I liked him in The Wire. Yeah, Boardwalk Empire, too, especially is what I th- probably think of him even just as much as uh, as as him being in The Wire, I guess. Um, I guess I've, I haven't watched all of Boardwalk Empire. I've, I've watched, watched some of it. I've watched it twice all the way through, and... Uh, more both times more recently than the last time I saw The Wire, so maybe that's why mm. I think of that first. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's not much to say about this other than he was a really great actor and gone too soon, of course. Yeah, there was a there's an interesting article. I'll just link to it in the show notes, probably. <laughs> um, a good article in uh, Jacobin about him and about how he. How he was like sort of shaping up to be like more of like a like a political activist. With, oh, really? With good politics? Yeah, that's basically like the takeaway from the article. I think um, he's like said some things in interviews that I've seen bits and pieces of that seem. I mean, he's not like he, <laughs> he's not like spouting like uh, theory and stuff. He's just like 
you know, he's speaking uh, plainly about like social realities and things like, but he did, he did basically say in one of these quotes that's been passed around a a bit on, on online, um, he was basically saying just like how class is like the thing that should unite people basically like uh, instead of letting, I guess like other forms of identity like divide us we're like most i usually agree with that yeah like mostly everything is just like cut down class lines it would be nice to live in a world where it would be simple enough to just be angry at class but we have to be angry at so many other things (laughs) yeah it's tough (laughs) it's almost like they've created all these other things to redirect our anger towards to make sure that we never focus all of our anger on the celestial dragons (laughs) I mean, the rolling glass. <laughs> yeah, we gotta ride. We gotta ride that big flying blue whale into those fucking dragons one of these days. Mm, that's the fucking dream. <laughs> the people think the flying blue whale was also made by the dragons. I'm just picturing this as a really f- weird um, 9/11 style scenario. Um, anyway, mm. R.I.P. Michael K. Williams. Um, and I know we've already, we've already done our, our Labor Day episode, but, you know, we're, we're ahead over here in Korea time-wise. So after that, I saw all of this shit on the internet that we would have probably brought up on that episode had it existed. It's but basically, we live in the future. Right. So it was just really annoying, like, uh, seeing, like, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and like all these figures like politicians and media figures giving lip service to like labor <laughs> and labor unions and stuff that's all it's just i mean everybody know, I mean, knows it's just like the hypocrisy makes you want to tear your hair out yeah like with and seeing Ka- why why is that hypocrisy is it because of something specific <laughs> is there something they won't give people that they won't fight for? What are you getting at, sir? <laughs> I'm getting at that they won't fight for, you know, making sure everyone has health care. Unions are usually good about making sure all the union members have health care. Imagine if the government acted as a union for the people. Like, the government was a voice that acted for the people and made sure the people got things. That's crazy talk. Like health care <laughs> or higher pay. Yeah, that was the, like, seeing Kamala Harris, like, do her drunk wine mom routine, like, in front of a crowd about, and whatever. She's some just, bull, like, you know, just platitudes about labor and stuff. Um, and then remembering that, like, she she kind of single-handedly... In a way, I mean, it's it's the it's the larger system that decided it, but it's really on her technically. Like, uh, she was the last person to give up on the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage going through uh, the Senate. She chose not to because the parliamentarian, you know, all that nonsense. That's her, right? Huh? Con- Wasn't she the parliamentarian too, or dumb? No, no. She's like, no. The parliamentarian is just some nobody. The parliamentarian is just like a fucking secretary. (laughs) And I know that's a, that sounds maybe, uh. I wish I was a secretary. Yeah, not to dismiss the importance of, uh, our our administrative assistance, but, um. They probably do more work than most people. But they're not politicians, and you don't have to listen to them. Like, they're just basically, they are there to be like, hey, I think you're breaking the rules. <laughs> That's or, hey, I wrote everything you're allowed to say. These are the things you're going to say today. Yeah. And the, the Democratic Party is just using the parliamentarian who, like, most people had never even heard of this pr- role in government. Hmm. I mean, shit, man. The story, like, we've talked about it. And you still thought it was the vice president. <laughs> but... I did. I really did think it was the vice president. No. I don't the, remember where I got that ideal from. Well, it might as well have been because like in a way like because the parliamentarian just said 
to Kamala and to Joe and to everybody what they wanted to hear, which is, oh, can't do it. Sorry. And then they just get to, they think that no one's going to notice that they're just like passing the blame onto this like meaningless position. But they did. They were like, the parliamentarian said, sorry, guys, <laughs> we can't, mm. can't give you, can't do it. Can't give you the $15 an hour minimum wage, which is not, not even which is like ten dollars an hour short of where we should be if we if you know if pay had risen with productivity, but uh, it hasn't. So yeah, so fuck all those people trying to cash in on uh, like all of the like blood spilled like in in labor movements to uh, get us things like the weekend and the 40 hour work week and stuff like hearing Joe Biden talk about that just sort of made my skin crawl. Although I read it, I read an interesting article today too, that was about how the big unions, you know, are just as much like part of the ruling class as anything else at this point. And so Joe Biden does actually, um, Represent the big unions? Represent them and like help, like give them the things they need or whatever. Like, he doesn't just give lip service about them because they help basically keep the um the actual workers from from organizing properly it's like it's it's almost like you have to start a union within the larger unions to destroy it and and make it uh pure again if it was ever pure in the first place so what you're saying is there's no hope <laughs> I mean, isn't that what we say every week? <laughs> I don't know. I used to have hope that things were going to get better. Obama took it away from you. I don't know who took it away from me. <laughs> you told well, me. Hey, they're he... passing a $3.5 billion infrastructure bill, right? $3.5 billion? Trillion? Quadrillion? Trillion. But, uh... Pentillion? But it's three point five pentillion. It's mostly just fucking handouts to big companies, and it's not really going to help anything. I mean, the infrastructure was co-written by Bernie Sanders. So what? <laughs> Bernie Sanders is a fucking. Uh, I don't know what he is, but he's not. He's not. He's not. He's not. He's at least not acting as a as a organizer in chief or whatever he was saying he was going to be. Um, he's not. Certainly not acting like a revolutionary. He's just doing exactly what Joe Biden tells him to do, which he said he would do. So that's not like he lied to us. Man it's likes to do his job. It's disappointing, but I don't even. I realize I just don't even really think about Bernie Sanders that much anymore. Like his birthday was just the other day, uh, yesterday maybe his 80th birthday, and I didn't. I just felt. I, I felt nothing. <laughs> I just was like numb to it. Like I wasn't, I wasn't like, oh fuck this guy, he's like let us down. But I also wasn't like feeling that old, that warm feeling of like Grandpa Bernie anymore either. Just kind of like I see. neutral feeling. I've been neutralized. Uh, my Bernie bro heart has been neutralized. Hmm. I feel that way sometimes. I mean, you said you're like yeah. you're basically just a blank. <laughs> I've given up Blank on page. the world getting better. I think the only thing I can focus on now is making my life better at the expense of other people. <laughs> Welcome to the human race, sir. I um, used to think that we could work together to make a better world, but these days I'm thinking perhaps I should just knock people over to make, to make a stairway to something better. I'm I'm basically at the point now where... I mean, like, I think about these, like, political things, you know, but, like, and we talk about them on the podcast, but, yeah, me, I mean, honestly, if I'm, if I'm getting, like, serious, like, I'm just thinking about how to not die from, like, whatever the next mutation of COVID is. Like, I, I was, mm. man, I read this thing, I read this thing, um... A few days ago. I'm not too worried about dying from COVID. I am, I man. <laughs> I am. Because it's just yeah, maybe it's maybe maybe the chances aren't super high for people in our demographic. And being in Korea, I mean, alone puts us in a better position than probably anybody in America, I feel like. 
at this point. Mm. But um, all the same, like, I'm not going to, I just like, I don't know. I feel like I can't like let my guard down. And I realize like, that's why I just really don't leave the house much, honestly. And I, and I, sometimes I'm like, am I depressed? No, I just don't want to, I just, I'm hiding from the fucking plague. Um, which then in turn is kind of depressing, but well, anyway, I was, uh, I read this, this thing for, it was a description written by a nurse, like who's been like, who's watched, like who knows how many, probably hundreds of people die in the hospital from COVID. And she describes in like pretty deep detail what the seven stages of COVID and, um, it was like horrifying. It was stuff I didn't even think about. Like once you get like, in, into into the later stages, well, where like you're basically a vegetable when they intubate you. Like people don't quite. I don't think a lot of people don't understand what intubation really means. You're not. That's not just the oxygen mask on your face. They jam a, a like a sharp tube into your throat. And it's like yeah. forcefully pumping air into your lungs, and you're basically unable to do anything. It's not like so. I think some people honestly probably imagine like, oh, if I get sick from COVID, big deal. I gotta sit in a hospital bed, and I can like you know look at my phone and shit. It's like no, no, no. You're gonna be just sitting with your fucking horrified thoughts, <laughs> and you know having a machine like work your lungs for you but um i don't know just the descriptions of like you know because they they get that once you're at that point like they're just they're cleaning you you can't shit or piss like in a toilet like you're basically you're basically vegetative um not technically but like like you might as well be um yeah just i mean it sounds and then she's describing like you know when you get to this certain point, then we get, we like put you on like FaceTime and it's like the last time you're going to talk to your family and like everybody knows it. And then, you know, sure. But some people recover. Yeah, I I know. I know. I'm just, I have heard that if you catch it and recover, you're, um, you're less likely to have terrible effects from it. The next time you catch it, (laughs) same thing as getting a vaccine, but, um, yeah. If you happen to caught it at one point, like in 2019 or 2020, and then and maybe you didn't even know and then got the vaccine, you're even less likely to get it again. You know, people people will be fine. We're just going to keep getting sick. Yeah. But how many how many more people are going to die? How many more people have to die? A lot less people would die if we just had vaccines. I mean, I know we have vaccines, but I guess I mean, like, if every country could make them quickly. Yeah. They can't. Yeah. And for no good reason. I mean, we might as well just get to that, to that part that we were going to talk about. I mean, I've been upset about this for a while. We've, we've talked about it, but, um, Biden, um, the, uh, the administration is still, Refusing to share the vaccine formula, even though the uh, U.S. government has complete right to do it, right? They can use marching rights. Yeah, well, they don't even. The thing is, is they don't. They don't even have to use that. Like Joe, but like the Moderna vaccine specifically, like according to like copyright law and patent law and and whatever, um, the government can share the the formula with whoever they want mm. uh, and joe biden simply refuses to do it um i mean and you know i mean china's not sharing their formula russia's not share, sharing their formula however like those countries are also i think doing a lot more um donating of vaccines or selling them like at a cheap rate Although I think the U.S. is still technically have donated more um, shots than uh, than any country, I think China is like second. But uh, yeah, I think so too. But it's all just like it's all just sort of like posturing on on everybody's part. Like it's just like the thing that it was described in some article I read is like um, 
it just seems va- mad va- to me. Vaccine diplomacy is what they called it. It's, it seems insane. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure it's. I'm sure Moderna doesn't want them to do it. Even though, I mean, I, I, I. Well, I know, like Moderna and Pfizer and et cetera, don't want their patents to be shared, right? Their, uh, their, um, formulas. Sorry, not patents. You know what I mean? The formula for making it. Yeah. Oh well. But same, it's insane same, same when thing. The world's yeah. in this situation. Like, if we make more of it faster and get it into more people, that's good. It's pretty simple. And I mean, another thing that's sort of simple too is the reason it doesn't happen, and it's it's kind of just the it's the logic of capitalism. You have to like create artificial scarcity. I mean, that's how you like boost your profits. You know, like the companies will profit more if they more slowly push this thing out, and. That's why it's going at that pace. It's not. It's nothing to do with like we don't have the the raw materials or the will or the or the funds. Like, and not just not just America either. Like I said, you know, these other big countries should be helping out as well. But yeah, the way I understand it through this um, article, I think by oh, it wasn't that wasn't Dave Sirota? It was but from his website the daily poster it goes into the more of the technical details of like how biden is legally able to do this but aside from what they say in that article there's another article i found that explains that um the government i mean the other thing is the government could just forcefully like nationalize <laughs> uh these these corporations like fully and, but they don't even need to go that far. There's like an in-between sort of stage that they could do, which you brought up. It's something called March in rights, um, which this person being interviewed said uh, on the question of, can we just share the, the IP for these vaccines? He says, it's possible, and it's very controversial. So on the one hand, on the domestic front, there are several federal laws that give the federal government what are called march-in rights, literally the ability to march in and demand licensing rights to a patented product in certain situations. The federal government seldom, if ever, exercises these rights. Um, They're controversial, of course, being because people, you know, don't want the market impeded and and so on but i feel like in a time of crisis <laughs> where you know i think what the 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 death toll in america is like probably get close to like 700,000 now i'm not even sure it's uh, it's yeah, real it's, it's realistically what probably well over a million i mean i've i've read a, a bunch of things that say that Basically, every vaccine like data about deaths is probably underreported. You mean not vaccine death? <laughs> Sorry, whoops. Uh, yeah, I just changed our podcast. We're gonna we're gonna push for everyone to take um, ivermectin only. Please don't. <laughs> no, I I meant uh, I just meant COVID deaths rather. But um yeah. Anyway, I'm just I knew what you meant. I'm just saying it's it's a fucking emergency. A lot of people have died already and then a lot of more people a lot of more people are going to die. Well, I mean, I think they're willing to just let people die. America's never even made a clear like goal for what they want as far as the end of the pandemic. Yeah, all they did Which is actually one of the big problems. Oh, but because the because the goal is unspoken and it's we're going to we're going to live with this thing, which means we're going to let people suffer and die unnecessarily. So we all just decided to be Sweden. S- At least they were upfront about it. Well, and then, I mean, they're not doing that anymore. And I mean, like, yeah, England and Sweden early on, both were like, well, we'll just get herd immunity because they, they stupidly thought it wasn't that serious. They thought like everyone could get infected and only like a fair, a few people would like actually be truly affected. Um, 
which is still crazy. <laughs> I mean, um, but like chicken pox. Yeah, except it's much, <laughs> it's much worse. Um, chicken pox was chicken pox was way de- deadlier. It was kind of a joke for me. We're lucky we had a chicken pox vaccine, right? Huh? I thought chicken pox was way deadlier. Like, there's no, it's there's, there's no vaccine for chicken pox. Are you sure? Isn't that the what whole? Am I po- thinking of then? Because that's the whole point of chicken pox was every kid gets it once and then you never get it again. Mm. That's what they would have like chicken pox parties even when I was a kid, and like they would purposely infect all the kids just to get it out of the way. <laughs> No, I mean, I think, I, I think, it, I think there was a time when it, I don't know, but like, it definitely is not deadly. I mean, I think it is in really, really rare circumstances, maybe. But, um, I mean, you must have gotten it, right? No, I've never been sick. <laughs> My entire life, it's pretty amazing. That is amazing. I think I'm a robot. <laughs> A robot with a blank memory bank. <laughs> now I feel like I gotta look up chicken pox later, but um, I'm pretty sure there's no... Va- if there is a vaccine, I... it was invented after I was like a child, because I definitely had chicken pox as a kid. And it, and I remember my brother having it, and it was just like... Descri- it was described to me as... Oh yeah, it's okay. Everybody gets it once, and then you'll never get it again because you have immunity. Oh, it came out in nineteen ninety-five. The chicken pox vaccine. See, I I would have had it already by then. You know, I'm I'm probably just thinking of the measles. The measles was Me- the measles is one that uh was deadly. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think yeah, chicken. I think that's what chicken pox has always they, just been like yeah. scratching. Your I think skin. I meant to say the measles. I'm just <laughs> being kind of dumb tonight, as always. Um, doesn't matter though. Um, because I don't. I guess the goal in America really is just to let people die. I mean, I actually, I'm still in the camp that if you're vaccinated, you're probably not going to die, even if you catch COVID, just because. With the variants, the effects are still very negligible as long as you're vaccinated. As far as I understand, you can still catch it, but but what's but there's a lot of people that's not. But what's not cool also is how so many kids are getting it now, and like they're like one in seven kids are having. Um, well, it's not cool that there's no mass mandates at American schools. Well, right. That's fucking crazy. I mean. Yeah. I, I would mean, refuse to go to work in Korea. Well, Koreans would refuse to go to work. <laughs> Parents yeah. would refuse to send their kids to school. You know what? Not the the ma- the mask thing just reminds me of uh yesterday I started watching um the most recent season of Law and Order or uh, Law and Order SSVU. Mm-hmm. Um and it's uh Man, you can really like you can see a lot of um shitty politics reflected in that show. Like just like it's like pure distilled like hashtag resistance politics. Like they talk they do all they do this like sort of obligatory like Black Lives Matter stuff. And um anyway, the whole point I was I want to get at is that they're because the show Law and Order's whole premise is that they they rip things from the headlines, right? Like, so their their plots are basically um, modeled after like what's going on in the news. So of course, like in the world of Law and Order, the TV show, like there's COVID and like, but like so the the randomness with which people wear masks on the show is just like hilarious to me, and and I. I was like, oh, well, it's probably just because it's a TV show, you know, and like, they they can't like, they probably like have like in the actors contracts, like they can't have their faces covered up like X percent of the, t- their screen time. But um, then it hit me though, like, oh no, like this is probably a reflection of just what America is like now. Like I just kind of forgot, you know, like seeing it like played out with like 
actual humans. It just I don't know. It's just so it's just so different from here and um and and and, and yeah. weird. Like like it's just it's they 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 wear the masks in a totally in a way that's just negates even why even why even have them. <laughs> and I feel like that's how people are probably really wearing them in the U.S. at this point. If they're even prote- even if they're even if they're um, making the eff- if effort, they bother effort at, at all. all, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Maybe we're just being too harsh on our U.S. brethren. I don't. Sorry if you're listening from the U.S. I don't know. I mean, I have another item like somewhere on this list of about how. Um, all around the country, they're like just packing to capacity, like uh, college football stadiums these days, and you just see like just mm. crowds of like ninety thousand people. I think like some of them are like. But the football players have to be happier, man. Cause they have the cheering crowds back. <laughs> it, it, I bet it was hard to play football without crowds. I don't. I've never. I don't know if they ever really life. even stopped. I mean, I remember seeing people coming back. Maybe they were. They were. They were still doing that thing where, mm-hmm. like, they had like cardboard people in the stands, but then real. Yeah. Re- no. I mean, real people could be scattered, but now they're just. They're just like, like fuck it. <laughs> they're like, who cares? New, new, uh, new, more deadly variant. Let's all crowd in together. And people, some people are saying like they're supposed to all be vaccinated. Bullshit! Come on. Some someone like someone figured out like the probability of that was like just so re- like uh, ridiculous. Um, based on like the the size of the college and stuff, and like how many people at the college were vaccinated. But anyway, um. Oh damn! Some of these some of these stadiums can hold over a hundred thousand people. I didn't realize that. Yeah, man, they're massive. I always thought of like professional sports stadiums as like holding like around like seventy or eighty thousand people, but mm, that's not enough people. <laughs> they're leaving. They're leaving dollar bills on the table. They're only holding that many. Maybe I'm maybe I'm remembering a simpler time in my childhood. I'm sure. I, I'm sure I am. I was. Uh, well, okay. Um, where were we? I mean, we were that we had we had to have our obligatory uh, COVID COVID thing. moment. I mean, one more thing to throw in about that, real quick, is that I saw someone remind people that were saying like online, basically like, I don't, I don't want my my son to have to take the, the damn vaccine, like, and their son was like in the air force or something, some some mil- branch of the military, and. Someone pointed out that that kid has already taken 17 mandated vaccines before the coronavirus vaccine. Yeah. Like you, that's that's yeah. how many vaccines you must take by law to like be in the military and this lady is yeah. freaking out about. Well, and I mean, I guess what they would fire back with is, well, those vaccines have been like more thoroughly tested and stuff, but um you know what the crazy thing is? RNA vaccines, that's what they're called, right? RNA? R- 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 mRNA. Like, like, I knew I skipped something. <laughs> Lowercase They're M. so much better. They're, they're literally just much better and more effective. It's how all vaccines should be made from this point. It is like an exciting new technology. That's or newish um, technology. Mm-hmm. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> People suck. But yeah, I just thought that was kind of funny. I didn't, I didn't quite realize that. It is funny. It's all just fucking. I mean, all of that, all the like vaccine problems, is all just as you as you have in the nose. It's just like fucking token symbolic culture war bullshit. When people refuse to take them and just anti-vaccine or you know, vax shaming. I don't fucking know. It's all just bullshit. People should just fucking do it. It's like. Wearing goddamn seatbelts. Now I'm sounding like a fucking... I don't know. Everyone did hate wearing seatbelts, though, when that became a law. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> me me being the guy I am who really likes seatbelts, because I've been in a few car accidents, um, I always get offended by my Korean friends who all seem to refuse to wear seatbelts. Or get into taxis where there's just fucking seatbelts are like cut out of the taxi for some reason. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Why does everyone hate seatbelts in this country? Nobody buckles up in the taxi, that's for sure. Except for me. Really? I never do. I do. (laughs) 
I'm a fucking weirdo. No, I mean, I mean, no, I, I, I probably, I should. I'm being, uh. You're probably more likely to die in a car than by coronavirus. Yeah, pro. yeah, I'm sure. Probably. So what I'm trying to say is fucking drive your car into the river. Don't use them anymore. Fuck your cars. <laughs> okay. Uh, I do dream of living in a world without cars, by the way. Um. I hate them. I think I feel like I've heard this before. I'm having de- deja vu. Like I have this dream that, like, sure, maybe keep your cars in rural areas, but my my dream situation is like a city like Seoul or New York. Everyone has to park their car outside the city, <laughs> and the only cars allowed in the city are public transport, I guess, taxis, and uh, transport for like goods. And then the rest of the roads are just used for fucking bicycles and walking. Sounds fucking brilliant. <laughs> I mean, the roads would still be fairly busy. Yeah, with, with those... bicycles. It would be a lot less busy, man. No, I know, I know. Um, It'd also help emissions so much. It's true. Anyway. This is all just fucking pipe dream shit. I've kind of uh, speaking of like giving giving up. <laughs> I've I feel like I've kind of given up on the idea of saving the environment. Honestly, I think it's too late. <laughs> and I th- no, I mean maybe we'll start making real progress when there's real water wars. <laughs> I just I saw something the other day, and it was like saying that when. When the when the global cl- uh, temperature shifts one and a half de- degrees Celsius, we're basically it uh, fucked. And I I thought it yeah I th- no I mean I thought it was higher I thought it was like it had to be higher than that a little bit like three degrees or two degrees. And seeing the one point five, I was like, it's probably already fucking done. <laughs> I just had that yeah that no I intuition. think I had, earlier this year. Uh, NASA had released a study about that that I think I'd shown you, and it's even it's just been ticking up since that study. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's 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 changed so fast already since the last time I like you know felt doom about (laughs) about the environment. But I don't know. Oh no, I I worry about the environment constantly. I also blame coronavirus on the environment. Like I actually think a lot of coronavirus is completely due to climate well, change, which maybe I'm wrong. It's not that I'm not I don't think I am. It's not that I'm not worried about it. I'm I'm just feeling a little more resigned to its inevitability. But sure. I don't know. So live your best life now inside your house because you can no longer go outside. And prepare for the day when we don't have houses anymore. I mean, the things that the th- things that clim- climate scientists have said we need to do to to prevent that, t- like hitting going over the tipping point, are like is close down capitalism. Essentially, like we ha- you have to like you can't like you have to like stop extracting everything out of the fucking ground like immediately, like yesterday. <laughs> And close down capitalism. It's just not gonna fucking happen. <laughs> well, it would be. It would, it's almost like this. It would, same thing we need to do to. But um, it would. It fix would, the virus. It would be closing down more than even just capitalism, because I mean, you could have a socialist like world, like global socialist government, and still be using fossil fuels. Um, so it's even beyond just like the ideological thing about capitalism too. But I mean. Of course, like uh, profit seeking and capitalism itself uh, make a lot of these things a lot harder to uh, to put an end to because they're so f- no, it's profitable. It's always been my understanding that like profit seeking corporations use up way more of those fossil fuels than individuals. Oh, for sure. That's- and the military, I mean, that's the other thing, is the uh, the military is the number one polluter on the planet. Um, like Which military? The U.S. military. Oh, I was wondering if it was like a different military. I knew it was the U.S. military. So I mean, it's, yeah. it's I, I should say it's worse. I think it's it's carbon emissions are, are worse than a lot of small countries, not worse than, say, the U.S. itself by itself. Like even mm. minus the military, or China for that matter. Um, 
but still pretty fucking oh God, it's really pretty fucking bad. <laughs> it's really intense sometimes living near China. Oh, the uh, the the air pollution. Yeah, yeah. Which um, I realize Korea creates a lot of its own air pollution, but. The NASA study said 30% of it's from China. That's actually a pretty high percentage considering how fucking far away China actually is. Yeah, that is that's pretty bad. I I've I've been reading things <laughs> that are telling me that China's really like truly like winding down a lot of its like um environmentally <sighs> disastrous uh practices. Uh, they are from my understanding that's more of like the case in their more inland places like Beijing. Okay. Where and they're moving it more to coastal regions, which is why the air pollution is reaching <laughs> they're places like, like Japan. They're like put it Korea. put it closer to Korea and Japan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they've actually moved a lot of it coastal so that uh it also helps China have less pollution because of the way the winds work. It usually blows it away from China. Yeah. Is it grifter or genius of them? Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's grifting, but it's it's just like it's um what there's a funny word for it that like that like business businessmen and economists use uh, externality. It's an externality. <laughs> it's when like some negative shit comes out of a corporation and like destroys something else. And they just they use this term that makes it sound so like abstract and okay. Like, oh, these are just our externalities. Mm. Um, okay, I know I said we were moving on from uh, coronavirus, but I mean this is just t- related to it. Um, so yeah, like I think the the discourse on ivermectin has has really ramped up. It's just like becoming more <laughs> so it's larger than it was a week ago. Um, and it's kind of just becoming really annoying to me, like from both, like both sides of it are just like, I just don't want to he- like hear about it anymore. But um, there was a study done in a prison using ivermectin uh, on pr- unknowing, unwitting prisoners um, without their consent or their knowledge and uh That's cool. it was found out and i mean it's just you know the drug is har- pretty harmless you would have to take like an insane amount of it to actually be poisoned or something but it's still like ethically fucked up to do fucking experiments on people like that um especially prisoners it just you know makes you think of say the tuskegee experiments or whatever um i forget where that was Anyway, um, it's actually weird to me that, so hear me out. I don't know if ivermectin should be hated as much as people hate it. No, the problem is simply people who are using it as a, as, as a substitute for vaccination. That's the problem. Yeah. The problem is not, I, I, I I realize that's the problem. Yeah. I just like, I want everyone to get the vaccine, but also it's not a bad tool for like people that already have it because it has, I mean, those people that already have it can also get the vaccine and take this. And I don't give a shit if people take it. Go ahead. Like, I mean, I honestly, if I didn't have to like seek it out, if someone just had it around, I would take like the recommended dose and see if it i mean the worst that's gonna happen is like nothing (laughs) like it 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 is a drug that has been like used on millions of people and i know i'm gonna start sounding like i'm like one of the people that that's pushing it but i'm not because i I obviously think that people should get vaccinated but like pete they probably it probably doesn't help at all but you know yeah i mean what i've heard is that like a lot of the studies are pretty flawed and um holy shit there's a gigantic fucking roach over in the corner <laughs> just staring at me oh no <laughs> anyway where were we uh we were talking about ivermectin um but i think yeah we were- ivermectin i was saying controversial stuff of i don't care about it i just want people to get the vaccine really that's what i want is everyone to get vaccinated not to sound just like Grandpa Joe. 
But I do think it'd be a nice first step. And it'd be amazing to live in a world where people weren't just fucking being weird about it. Yeah. I think what what's what's irritating even about the people who are like making fun of ivermectin like oh it's the horse dewormer which yes it is that but it is also a human drug whatever it's just such a boring argument but like um that type of shaming makes the people who are already hesitant about the vaccine more hesitant yeah it doesn't help anybody it just draws a lot and i don't even really care that much about like hurting their feelings or whatever but like the point shouldn't be that ivermectin is for horses the point should be you should get vaccinated and go ahead, take that shit if you want. Yeah, people take multivitamins. Like, they do fucking nothing. There's really, and then, like, you know, there was some, like, fake story that was out that was, like, even reported on, like, Rachel Maddow and, like, some, like, big mainstream source places um, about, like, what was it? It was saying that, like, there were so many ivermectin overdoses uh that that it was it it literally stopped stopped a gunshot victim from being admitted to the ER at some hospital and it was just like I've heard it's impossible to overdose on this wired article that I had pulled up where they were talking about how there's going to be better clinical trials of it in the next day or so well i think or they're starting i think some said it's new i think some people have gotten sick from it because if they're literally taking the horse medicine, which I think some people have done, a few people, because they just, they're stupid. Um, I mean, I one time bought fish vaccine, not fish I'm vaccine, saying like fish antibiotics have, because I was sick and I couldn't go to the doctor. That's funny, but that's kind of different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but they were like, you you, can't, you have to go to like a feed store or something to get like the stuff yeah. for cows and horses. And anyway, like that's that that stuff's obviously going to be like a way. It's a mega dose co- for compared to the human dose. And if you're taking that, yeah, of course you're going to like get sick. I mean, I don't think anyone's died from it, but like anyway, it's just it's just another one of these stupid fucking like signifiers, you know, like you were saying about masks, like, you know, this is just people like having a tribal fucking online battle about like, I hate horse medicine. I love horse medicine. And it's like it just gets so tiring like instantly. Um yeah, I don't know. What else is there to talk about? Tar Reed was t- trending recently, and I don't even really remember the reason. She always comes up when there's like some sort of like scandal. I think it's because of the uh the Times Up people like basically all resigned cuz they were like there was some scandal with them and the and Andrew Cuomo. Um, see now I just sound stupid. Like I didn't, I didn't get, pay attention to the the details, but I think it was basically like they were they were kind of downplaying and protect downplaying the the seriousness of and sort of shielding Cuomo about like the allegations against him, and the fact that their people are uh, resigning makes me think you know they probably really did some bad shit, and I. I mean, I think the way they treated Tara Reid was fucking disgusting and terrible. They're the ones who, like, turned her away and said that, you know, her story's not good enough or whatever. Fake, yeah. Um, So, of course, then just, like, that same old arguments explode online um, about the um, credibility of Tara Reid. I say Tara. Is it Tara or Tara? I don't know. It's Tara. I'm pretty sure it's Tara. My bad. That's what they always say on the the NPR podcast when I'm listening to it. I don't know why I've been saying Tara, but... Tara Reed. Um, I mean, you're showing her the same respect that everyone else is showing. (laughs) Don't worry, she's used to it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we don't need to, like, get deep into the the whole saga. Um, Although I I think it is... I think it is complete bullshit that Joe Biden is getting a total pass on this thing. Um, it's infuriating, actually. Uh, but then, like the the worst 
one of the most annoying things, I guess, is seeing like liberals, good like lockstep, you know, vote blue no matter who liberals, just so disgustingly like uh, disregarding her her experience and what and her like you know for lack of a better word testimony i guess or story um but then at the same time saying believe women believe all women even <laughs> and they're like hashtag believe women i believe um was it chris dr dr ford the the woman who accused brett kavanaugh and like this is not to say that i don't believe her story but her story is way less credible than Tara Reed's story, like by a long shot in like every respect. She didn't even know what year the assault happened. She's like, I'm not sure exactly. It could have been 82 or 81, something. I forget what the years were. And like people that were like close to her said that she was a liar, like her like best friend. Anyway, there were like a lot of things going against what her test, her, her testimony. And yeah, if you just like, I've seen these like these like online like uh, infographics that like sort of just compare and contrast like say her story with Tara Reid's story and it's just like this checklist of like things that would make you more credible or less credible um and yeah they're just like they just they just lot I thought that well, they just lie about her, always. and they say like they say she changed her story. She's always changing her story, which is just not true. She expanded on her story um, initially because f- at first she just talked about sexual harassment, and then she went further to talk about the actual assault, which is, uh, according to like experts on this stuff, a very common, understandable way that people start to publicly you know, talk about this really fucked up stuff that's happened to them. And sure. <laughs> and, um, and then of course there's just all the like Russia insanity. They try to say she's like a fucking, a fucking Russian agent and all this shit. Cause that's just what they, what everyone falls back on when, when someone's like messing with their favorite politician. Anyway, you, you, you were going to say something. I lost it. I was just going to say that, in in this perfect world, I thought you were always supposed to believe the victim. I mean, that was literally the hashtag going, and then and mm. it was you know believe all women. I believe yeah, that was what it was. And I think they actually just after Tara Reid, I think people just started. They took the word all out. There's <laughs> like uh, believe women. I believe women. Sometimes women are Where's not believable of, <laughs> when they're, it, and it just so happens the ones that I don't believe are co- politically inconvenient for me, <laughs> and the ones I do believe are politically advantageous for me. So I really support them. It's just all so like transparently obvious what's going on, and um, I hate it. <laughs> I don't know. I saw that she's starting a podcast also, like hmm. as of to like soon i guess um i don't know good for her um i don't have much more to say about that really um it just it was came popped up again i was gonna say i know there's more on the list but i think we should wrap up soon because my brain is fizzling out suddenly yeah okay um i just wanted then let's talk about the very last thing on the list um oh so there's this insane phenomenon happening that like I well I'll just explain what it is first. Um states are are uh demanding that people have to pay back all of the unemployment funds that they've been given over like the last year. So people are getting like bills from the state saying you owe us $16,000, you owe us $30,000 you know, in that range, basically. And like, who the fuck get, if you were just on unemployment for a whole year, chances are you probably don't have a giant savings <laughs> that you could manage. I mean, of course they'll probably say like, Oh, there's a payment plan, but it's like, how is this legal? <laughs> you know, it just seems so crazy to me. Yeah. I don't understand how it's, this is legal. 
Like I would, if I got that bill, I would just be like, I wouldn't even for a second think about paying it back. I would mean, like no, me either. And like a lot of I mean, a lot of, I've a lot of people are like like having like meltdowns over this thing. Like they're getting this bill and they're just like panicking because you know they have that feeling of like it's a bill I have to pay it, but like why do I have to pay it? Um, Best to ignore those. Which was- I've never had one of those specifically, but like I, when I left Citibank, they had overpaid me and they actually, um, I mean, they fired me and they, they sent me an angry letter being like, you got to pay us back what we overpaid you. And I never did. And that's what I recommend with this unemployment shit. If anyone asks you to pay them back, I don't think you have to. (laughs) I'm probably wrong. You probably can get in fucking trouble for it. But make them, make them come after you. That's what I'm trying to say. It is shitty. It's I just, so don't, I just, I'm, I'm truly like, I'm actually surprised by this in a way. I mean, of course, they get on the other hand, then I'm not. But it, this seems low even for <laughs> the shitty government. <laughs> I don't, I really like, of, and of course, like, if people knew that, they probably wouldn't have even accepted the goddamn benefits. <laughs> but I don't know. I just don't know how this is legal. Like I looked, I looked into it a little bit, and the only thing that comes up when you like Google like the right t- like you know keywords is people who've been overpaid somehow. I don't know. I don't really know how you can be overpaid on unemployment, but. And I don't know how that could result in like sixteen thousand dollars over the course of a year, but that's all I can find about this is like when people have to pay back their their unemployment money um it's for overpayment, but I don't know it just mm-hmm. sounds like total it's, total bullshit to me, yeah, it sounds like bullshit to me too. I don't really understand how they can get away with it, but I guess they do. I don't know. Like, this is one of those times where I'm like, I'm like really feeling like, like, like this helpless feeling of like, where's this, where's the authority figure to like, give me answers about this. Like, no one seems to know what's going on with this. Um, Maybe like eventually, like it will become such an issue that people are going to have to talk about it in public. Like, you know, people representing the government. Cause so far it doesn't seem like anyone understands why this is happening um i've never heard of something like this happening and maybe it it's happened just like but only to like a few people so you just never heard about it but now it's happening to a bunch of people i don't know it's uh it's i don't know i just felt really bad for like i saw like a bunch of like videos and like posts and stuff that were like from people having this happen to them and just felt really bad for them also, one quick, quick story. <laughs> Speaking of bullshit, Jill Biden is being like praised as being like this groundbreaking like figure uh, in the White House because she's taking a quote unquote full time job in addition to being the first lady. You know, all that hard work the first lady does. So people are like fucking yes queening her and stuff and like <laughs> I thought she was a teacher. Yeah, she's going to teach um two days a week at a, some college. So how how is that full time? That's that's the controversy I guess is like people are saying what the fuck full time my ass like she's going in twice a week. And some people were liter some people were actually trying to make the math work. <laughs> like and defend her. I was like, even if I wonder how much she's fucking getting paid for being, you know, famous and <laughs> it's funny, I didn't even agree to lecture. I didn't even think about that aspect of it until now. Probably probably way more than any other adjunct professor. Oh yeah. I'm sure. <sighs> I mean my friends who are adjunct professors in the States are living on pennies. Oh yeah, you get just because they have a dream of like actually being a professor one day, but really all they have is hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for pursuing higher education. Still jealous of them though. 
I still have that dream of how nice it would be to be a professor. Imagine just wandering around a campus your entire life, smoking a pipe, <laughs> talking about educated white guy shit, navel gazing. Yeah, mm. I mean, I I kind of thought that that's where I I maybe would end up to when I was more into like academic shit. But um, I remember also realizing how miserable it it could be. Even if I got, even if you got like that kind of nice cushy job, I feel like it would be, it would get kind of like, I don't know. Yeah, it couldn't be, couldn't be as fulfilling I, as making sure a generation of young people know English. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is, I remember like thinking about it and having this kind of like this existential terror of thinking about it, like, like, oh fuck, I. That would be a, that would be horrible too, and then just having this feeling of like, is it anything I do, like any job I'm gonna have, gonna be like fulfilling? Um, no, it also. <laughs> I think actually that was more my realization that I I was sick of like thinking about like philosophy because that's what I was like pl- uh, that, that's what I was planning on teaching at that time, uh, and I was like, I was like imagining like just like teaching teaching philosophy every day and how fucking bored I'd get and like miserable. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like almost like, you know how like, like people tell, (laughs) tell kids, you know, when they stop telling them you can be anything you want and they get more realistic and they're like, listen, only one in like 10 billion people can become like a rock star or a movie star. So got to give those dreams up and uh, get a real job. But like, it's the same thing with academia. I would say too, like getting a truly good professorship. Like I, it's, it's just very rare. You have, you basically have to have like, like a fa- book, a family that like went to that university for like generations <laughs> um, or, or a book or, or, or if, if you've already like, become sort of famous on your own. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just saying like, or, you know, you went to an Ivy and then you decide that you can spend the rest of your life teaching at a state school. Yeah, that's that. But yeah, but that, that wouldn't be one of the good jobs. (laughs) I don't think. Oh yeah. I mean, well getting tenure, I think these days the good job is if you can just find a university willing to give you tenure and not make you be an adjunct professor forever. But that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, how did we get here? Unless you, <laughs> fuck if I know. Oh, we're talking about Joe Biden. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the university just fucking gave her tenure. It's like you're first lady. You just get it automatically. I remember, I remember around the time I was a junior in uh, univer- in university college, whatever the fuck I call it these days. I don't know when I started calling it university. I think it's living in Korea it, made me start calling it, it university. Mu- I used to call it college. It, I really did used to call it college. It must be from living um, here. I remember when Al Gore came and spoke at my university when I was uh, when I was a lad at the uh, East Tennessee State University, the, the classic um, teacher's college I went to. And my dean came out. I don't fucking remember the name of the dean at the time. What was his name? Oh, fuck. It doesn't fucking matter. And he gave Mr. Gore, Mr. Could have been President Gore, (laughs) an honorary PhD. That motherfucker got a PhD and never once attended a fucking PhD class. Yeah, they... I'm so jealous. They do that. I want my fucking honorary PhD. I remember Stephen Colbert had, like... I feel like he got, like, like many (laughs) of those. Mm. Because he would just, like, demand that he get one on television, and then the school, like, to boost their profile would do it. Um, Yeah. That was when Stephen Colbert wasn't a total sack of shit, (laughs) when he was actually... A uh, cool, interesting, funny person. Um, those were the days a long time ago, like 15 years ago. God damn. Well, I guess we should wrap it up there. So let's recommend some stuff and skedaddle. Sure. I'm going to recommend... Um... 
something. <laughs> I uh, recently listened to the audio version of the Sandman comics. I really liked it. Who? Uh, I I thought it would be really dumb to uh, make a audio book of graphic novels. Turns out I really enjoyed it. Uh, Sandman's like the famous comics by uh, Neil Gaiman. I guess that's what originally put Neil Gaiman on the map. On the map, but they made like a audio version recently. It's an audio book. It's actually it's it's the same story, but it's made for audio. And I listened to it over the past week, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm going to recommend that the Sandman audio books based on the Sandman comics. I guess an adaptation of the comics, because they're not... I mean, obviously, you can't really translate comics to an audiobook for various reasons. Yeah, they're, but they're cool. pretty I recommend them. Im- image-heavy. <laughs> um, <laughs> does Neil Gaiman read the text? Uh, yeah, but it has voice actors. Okay. That's cool. I like uh, a good, good audiobook. Which are I feel I and feel I think, are kind of few and far between in a way, but I guess I don't really check out a lot of them. Part two just recently came out, but um, it's got like a good cast, like Jeffrey Wright's in it from Westworld, and um, some other people. Brian Cox is in it. Oh, cool. David Tennant. Yeah. That's I recommend. Them. That's the guy from uh, the. Doctor Who, Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Broad Church. Oh, right, yeah. Okay, I'm going to recommend... Um, what should I call this? I'm going to recommend a Yelp review. <laughs> um, so, let's, let's start at the beginning. Paul F. Tompkins is a very funny... Oh, wait, could I... Include one more actor from that audio <laughs> list. I, I didn't finish. Please go ahead. I interrupt you, but uh, it also has this little-known person named James McAvoy, and uh, Michael Sheen, and Andy Serkis in the cast. Ah, oh, it's a good cast. It's a good cast. <clears throat> Ten hours of entertainment, man. A lot of uh, bros. Did wait? I'm just not naming the women <laughs> because I figure they don't matter. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> we'll skip my recommendation and say goodbye. <laughs> um, uh, that would just be a really funny way to go out. Uh, Paul F. Tompkins is a really funny actor, comedian, writer, guy. I'm guessing, I feel like most people should know who Paul F. Tompkins is. Maybe, I don't know. He um he over the years though he's appeared a lot on comedy podcasts like Comedy Bang Bang and uh his own podcast that he had for a while the Paul F what was it called the Paul F podcast Tom Tompcast fuck I can't remember Pod F Tompcast something like that Anyway, he's really good at doing um, like characters, and a lot of times he'll do he'll do some just like fictional characters, but he he also does like real life uh, people, um, including Werner Herzog, uh, the you know the German documentarian who's very dry and like pessimistic, and he captures Her- Werner Herzog so well, and. Uh, so one of the things he did for one of the appearances he made on Comedy Bang Bang was he wrote a Yelp review on like he actually wrote it on Yelp as Werner Herzog reviewing um <laughs> the shopping experience of going to Trader Joe's and it's just like it just sounds like voiceover from like a Werner Herzog documentary it's like I think the very first sentence I just read it again today is madness reigns <laughs> and like it's just like this bleak take on like making a trip to like the grocery store basically and it's just really fucking hilarious and uh i will link it i will link you to uh him reading it i will link you to the text and i will link you to even funnier a video where Werner herzog is doing an interview and the interviewer plays him the Paul F. Tompkins as Werner Herzog thing. 
and he and he actually like approves of it. He's like, well, his accent is a little off, but the text is superb. <laughs> It's just really funny, and I hadn't thought about it for a while. Uh, something made me think of it again today. I can't remember what it was now. But um, anyway, it's really funny. You should check it out. It's very short. It won't take up more than, say, less than two minutes of your time, it looks like here. But, um, if only I had two minutes of time. <laughs> and so with that, we say we'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. Something, something, mm. some sunny day. Yeah, I'm gonna go watch some shit about Hillary Clinton. Now. Oh, I gotta. <laughs> I did download it. I gotta do that too. <laughs> shit, that means I'm probably not gonna edit this tonight, which means this will go out a little late. We are gonna. Should we just say this on the podcast? I mean, just, oh. What we're doing tomorrow? Oh yeah. Yeah, we're gonna be on a BDS episode. <laughs> Yes, Boomer Death Squad has invited us to uh, talk about the brand new American crime story. Is that what it's called? Mm, that is what it's called. Uh, impeachment edition, which is this hilarious uh, looking. I actually, I did watch it already, but I got I want to watch it again before tomorrow. Um yeah, it's just depicting the Monica Lewinsky scandal, and Clive Owen <laughs> plays Bill Clinton, which is fucking insane. Um, anyway, look for that as well. And look for us on the internet at heatdeathpod.com and on Twitter at heatdeathpod. Hmm. All right, let's, uh, hmm. let's go watch this weird-ass show. <laughs> Oh, I will. <laughs> I think. All right. It's going to be I'll, hard not to watch One Piece. I'll see you, I'll see you bright bright and early tomorrow. That's the other thing yeah, is we're starting because at- of the time difference, me and Jason are, are so graciously being the people who have to do this in the morning. Uh, we gotta, yeah, it's better for gotta me, though, get a, I think. Got to start recording at like nine in the morning. Mm. All right. Okay. See you later. All right, see you later. I'll send you this audio in a bit. Sounds good. See ya. Okay, bye. Bye.
The first voice recording was made in 1860. It was a 10-second fragment of the French folk song Au Claire de la Lune recorded by inventor Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. But who will make the final voice recording and when? What will it be? Who will hear it?